Hi and good morning. Uh, welcome to the second joint session for GCPR, uh, VCVM and VMV. Uh, I hope you had a good night's rest after uh, today, uh, yesterday's uh, packed day of, uh, of conference. And uh, yeah, again, we have uh, four uh, exciting talks uh, from all the uh, three conferences. Uh, we'll start off with GCPR. Uh, then uh, with two short GCPR talks, then we have one VMB talk and we'll close the session with a uh, VCBM talk. Um, our uh, first speaker will be Annika Hagemann. Uh, and the title of her paper is Bias Detection and Prediction of Mapping Errors in Camera Calibrations. Okay. Hi everyone, um, I'm Annika and I'd like to present our work on bias detection and prediction of mapping errors in camera calibration. So from a geometric perspective, cameras map points from the 3D world to a two-dimensional image. And in order to use a camera as a measurement device, this mapping must be known very precisely. So given a 3D point and the pose of your camera, you want to be able to tell where this point will end up in the image. And of course, this will depend on your particular camera, its focal length, its lens distortion, and so on. And obtaining a model for the mapping of your camera is exactly the task of camera calibration. And what I'm going to talk about today is how certain am I that my model, so the result of my calibration, actually reflects the real camera and which errors and which uncertainties remain. Now, first of all, how is a calibration typically done? In a typical calibration workflow, you first collect a number of images with a camera that you want to calibrate and typically people use well-defined calibration targets such as this chessboard here where the corners are easily detectable and you know the position of each of the corners relative to the board. Um, then a camera distortion model must be chosen and unfortunately we cannot model every camera using a simple pinhole model but depending on the lens distortion more complex models are needed. Now once we've decided on a hopefully reasonable, reasonable model we can estimate the model parameters and that's essentially a model fit. So we try to minimize the difference between your model's prediction and the actual observation. So in this case, we want to minimize the distance between the predicted image coordinates of the chessboard corners and the observed coordinates. And now we come to the question that I actually want to address today. And that is how well does this calibration result now model my real camera and which errors and which uncertainties remain. And as basically any data modeling problem, camera calibration is subject to two types of errors and that are systematic errors and parameter uncertainties. Now, systematic errors occur if the chosen camera model is not capable of modeling the true geometric behavior of the camera. So for instance, if we only allow for radial lens distortion, but in fact we have a strong tangential distortion. Now, parameter uncertainties, on the other hand, um, refer to the precision with which parameters could be estimated based on the available data. And I'm now going to present two methods to capture the these two fundamental types of errors. And I'm going to start with systematic errors. Now, the most common approach to detect systematic errors is to look at the residuals of the calibration. So the difference between the predicted and the observed coordinates on the calibration data set. And we can look at the individual residuals or at the RMSE. But independent of which quantity exactly we look at, there's um, an important limitation. And that is even if we had chosen the perfect camera model, so even if there were no systematic errors at all, the residuals will not be zero. And that is because corner detection is gener generally not perfect. So given only the residuals, it's generally quite hard to tell whether they are only due to the detector noise and therefore inevitable, or whether they could actually re be reduced by choosing a better camera model. Now to put that into a formula, the average reprojection error will always be a superposition of the random error caused by the corner detector error and the systematic error contribution. And in order to detect systematic errors, we therefore propose a way to disentangle those two, uh, those two error contributions. So this is the equation that we've just seen and we would like to determine the systematic error contribution. What we know are the total error, the number of parameters and the number of observations. 
So to get the systematic error, we need a way to determine the detector variance independently. And the, the important thing to note here is that the detector variance is not always the same. It depends on a number of things, including um, your camera, your content detection algorithm, the local blur in the image, the light, and so on and so on. So um, basically, we need a way to separately estimate the detector noise on your particular data set. And we do so by separately looking at local groups of observa observations and re-optimizing their pose. So we virtually decompose our calibration target into several smaller targets. And the underlying idea is that within such local image patches, systematic errors such as unmodeled lens distortion um, can almost completely be compensated by adjusting the pose. And therefore, for these local optimizations, the average error is mainly governed by the detector noise. So we can use the error of these virtual targets to obtain an estimate for the detector noise. And what we then propose is to compute the bias ratio, so the fraction of the error caused by bias as a simple measure to characterize the amount of systematic error. So what does it look like in practice? Um, here we've calibrated a camera with models of increasing complexity, um, which you can see on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you can see the bias ratio for each of those calibrations. And for a plain pinhole model, which is on the far left side, the bias ratio is basically one. And that shows you that the error is completely dominated by a systematic error. Now, when adding more and more parameters, the bias ratio reduces until for two radio distortion parameters, the bias ratio only is less than 10%. And this would be acceptable in a, in a vast range of scenarios. So by quantifying the amount of bias, the bias ratio can also help you select an adequate camera model. Okay, so now that we found a way to detect systematic errors, we can come to parameter uncertainty. And as I said, parameter uncertainty refers to the precision with which model parameters have been estimated. And there will always be some remaining uncertainty, but the goal is, first of all, to be aware of the remaining uncertainty because it will propagate to all subsequent applications and to get uncertainties as low as possible. And the most common way to quantify uncertainty is to look at the covariance matrix of model parameters. And this covariance matrix actually contains exactly the information that we need. The only problem is that covariance matrices are not really intuitively interpret interpretable. So for instance, if you have a covariance of 0 0.03 between first and second radial distortion parameter, it's quite hard to tell whether that's okay or whether that's a problem. And of course, this matrix will also look very different depending on your camera model. So you must be quite experienced with all sorts of models to get an intuition for the magnitudes. So we thought about a way to condense the information contained in this matrix in a way that is understandable and independent of the underlying camera model. And the underlying idea is that actually we're not interested in the model parameters. What we actually want to know is how certain are we that our camera maps a certain 3D point to a certain position in the image or more generally, what is the uncertainty in the mapping behavior of the camera? And we therefore came up with a way to propagate parameter uncertainties to the image. And this is what you can see visualized here. So when the model parameters deviate by some vector delta theta, then the image coordinates of a set of 3D points will also deviate in some way. And we can formulate the mapping error as the average deviation in the image coordinates as a function of the, param of the parameter error. So um, we can then show that we can actually approximate this mapping error um, with a quite simple formulation, which is just a quadratic form in the parameter error with a model matrix H that basically quantifies the increase in mapping error depending on the parameter error. And given this very simple formulation, and since we know that the parameter error will be normally distributed with covariance sigma, we can predict the distribution of the mapping error and also its expected value. And what we find is that the expected value is actually given by this quite simple expression, which is the trace of this matrix product here.
So in short, we broke this complicated covariance matrix down to, to a single value, describing the expected error in the mapping of the camera. So again, what does it look like in practice? Um, here is an example of two calibrations. Um, on the left-hand side, there is a calibration with a very uninformative data set. So it's only three images and the target is really small in the image. So you cannot estimate the parameters very reliably. And this is what the expected mapping error also tells us. Um, it tells us that we can expect our calibration result to deviate from the real camera by half a pixel squared, and this is quite high. Now for the calibration with a more diverse data set, with more images and more, and more diverse poses, the expected mapping error is accordingly lower. So basically you get a direct feedback on whether your data set was sufficiently informative or not. Now, coming back to the original workflow of camera calibration, um, what we suggest is to always, um, in the end, add a last step, which is evaluating the calibration result and to compute the bias ratio to detect systematic errors and potentially go back to selecting a better or more complex camera model and to use the expected mapping error to quantify the remaining uncertainty and potentially go back to collecting a more informative data set. And in our paper, we also test both methods and simulations and experiments, and we show that we can improve a system for guided calibration. Um, but unfortunately, I cannot show all of that here. Um, so thanks a lot for listening and feel free to ask any questions. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, unfortunately, I think in the interest of time, we don't have uh, the time for live questions. Um, but uh, of course, uh, I hope there will be uh, follow up questions in Discord. So um, I would just ask you, Annika, to, to check Discord afterwards, uh, have an eye on the yeah. channel. And um, yeah, let's thank uh, Annika again, and uh, let's continue with the second talk of this session, uh, which will be given by Rama Kanukuri. Um, so he's uh, from the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems here in Tübingen, and also affiliated with the University of Siegen. And uh, yeah, there he is. Um, so yeah, um, and the title of his talk will be uh, Learning to Identify Physical Parameters from Video Using Differential Physics. So stage is yours, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, hello everyone, I'm Ramakrishna Kandukuri, and this work is done in collaboration with Ian Akterhul and Jörg Strickler at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems and Michael Muller at the University of Siegen. The field of video representation learning deals with uh, learning useful rep representations from video. Intelligent agents must learn to autonomously move in the environment, particularly using vision, as it contains a lot of information and they should be capable of prediction, predicting how the future frames look when conditioned with actions and previous frames. To do this, it must have a sense of physics of the environment. Planning and control using the predictions to plan its trajectories in the environment and then to control. And scene understanding. For example, inferring states of objects in the scene and their interactions, which are the main objectives of our paper. We will also show how we use our learned knowledge of the scene for video prediction. Video prediction models typically have a recurrent encoding architecture Implicitly, they encode a sequence of images into latent representations, perform transitions with or without conditioning on actions, and obtain uh, future representations and render those into images. Typical video prediction models do not require any domain knowledge. Everything is learned and thus require more data. We incorporate our knowledge of physics and thus making it a hybrid model which needs less data. Typical models do not explain why a model works and why does it not work. Maybe the problem is still constrained. We learn the physical parameters of objects in the scene and explain the problem based on the observability of these parameters. Typical models have an uninterpretable latent representation. 
we learn physical interpretable latent representation. So our contributions in this paper are, we propose supervised and self-supervised approaches to learn to encode physical scenes into physical scene representations of objects. And to learn physical parameters like mass and coefficient of friction and use the learned parameters for video prediction. We analyze the observability of physical parameters in tasks like pushing, sliding, and collisions. And also our methods accuracy in recovering objects force and physical parameters. For encoding, we use a three image sequence and extract the poses of objects from each image using a convolutional neural network. We then estimate the velocities from the difference in poses. We do this for two reasons. One, the encoder does not need to implicitly learn the physics of the scene. This allows the model to scale for arbitrary forces. Like in short, um, this might be because the uh, the high magnitude, for, high magnitude of forces that are not seen in the not seen in the training will result in high magnitudes of velocities, which can throw off the encoder, since it was not seen in the training. But if we only learn to infer the poses, the encoder will be robust to such effects. For transitions, we use a differentiable physics engine, which is formulated as a linear complementarity problem (LCP). We describe the unconstrained dynamics for translation and rotation using Newton's Euler equations. We discretize the velocity and use an impulse velocity-based formulation where friction has nice properties. For example, in here, the acceleration is discretized as the difference between uh, velocities at the current time step and the future time step divided by the time step. And the product here, h into like uh, the time step into force is called the impulse. We then constrain it with joint friction contact and frictional constraints using Lagrange multipliers. This results in a linear complementarity problem formulation. The equations below serve as example to show the formulation for joint constraints. Here, Lambda E is called the Lagrange multiplier for joint forces and J, J E is the Jacobian for joint forces. We then solve the resulting linear complementarity problem using the primal dual interior point method. To obtain the analytical gradients, we differentiate the KKT conditions. We initialize the physics engine with the inferred poses and velocities and apply forces to transition into future states. For supervised training, we first calculate the loss between the ground truth and the physics engine predicted poses. The loss here uh, I refer to is mean squared error. And secondly, we infer the encoder pose for the next time step and calculate the MSC loss between the ground truth and the encoder inferred poses. We then minimize the sum of both the losses using an atom optimizer. We decode uh, the estimated poses into images using spatial transformer networks. For that, we assume no knowledge of objects appearance, that is shape, size and texture, etc. We extract the objects from images using segmentation, mas segmentation masks only in the first frame and only for the decoding purpose. And we also assume known cameras intrinsics and extrinsics. This formulation structures are latent space and thus make it, making the whole pipeline end-to-end -end differentiable. For the self-supervised training, firstly, we calculate the loss between the ground truth frames and the frames reconstructed from the physics engine predicted poses. And secondly, we infer the encoder poles for the next time step, similarly as we did for supervised training and reconstruct it and calculate the MSC loss between the ground truth frames and the frames reconstructed from the encoder inferred poses. We then minimize the sum of both the losses using an atom optimizer. So, to learn the physical parameters in different scenarios, we exploit the observability of these parameters. 
For easier understanding, we present 1D and 2D equations along with the free body diagrams which represent the 3D scenarios. Here, an uh, F external represents the externally applied forces on the objects and small f represents the frictional forces. And M represents the mass and mu represents the coefficient of friction. For pushing task, we can infer either mass or coefficient of friction, but not both at the same time. As we can see from the equation below, this problem will be ill posed if we do that. For sliding, we have an object freely falling on the, on the ramp and then sliding down. And it purely acts under the influence of gravitational force. And thus, um, since there are no external forces, we can only infer the coefficient of friction and not mass. And this is evident from the equations below. For collisions, however, if we have two objects made of the same material and we know the mass of one object, we can infer the mass of the other one and the common coefficient of friction between the object and the ground plane as seen from the equations below. Here, F1 and F2 are just frictional forces um, with respect to the blocks and the ground plane. And mu is the common coefficient of friction, like uh, in, only in this case, F1 equal to F2. So coming to the training procedure, we use PyBullet to generate synthetic data for our experiments. For each scenario, we sample 2000 trajectories with 300 frames each. On each step, we apply random forces and use the same applied random forces to learn the physical parameters using the differentiable physics engine. Um, for supervised and self-supervised experiments, we pre-train the encoder for a certain number of epochs in an encoder in, with respect to the labels or with respect to the input frames uh, just to stabilize the training. This makes sure that when we start optimizing for physical parameters, the initial poses are not completely off. Uh, in the self-supervised setting, um, we use Gaussian smoothing on reconstructed images to better localize the objects in the beginning of training. We slowly reduce the smoothing over the course of training. And coming to the supervised learning results, <clears throat> for pushing, in one experiment, to learn mass, we fix the coefficient of friction to a known value, and in other, vice versa. Uh, this is because, uh, as explained before, uh, if we try to infer both of them at the same time, the problem would be imposed. However, for collisions, we infer both mass and coefficient of friction simultaneously. We can see that the values for the physical parameters have converged very close to the ground truth values and the position inference error for all the scenarios is between two to 8%, and the rotation inference error for the collision scenario is eight, is eight degrees. Coming to the self-supervised learning results, we note that we do not have sliding block experiments. This is because we decode our poses using spatial transformer networks, and currently we are restricted to only reconstructing 2D views, and the sliding block scenes have an inherent 3D view. In the plots, we see that the values for the physical parameters are oscillating near the ground truth values. This is because of a large error in pose inference, which is between seven and 12%. And the rotation inference error for the collision scenario is eight degrees. The learn, the learn physical parameters are used for video prediction. The first frame of the 200 frame rollout is provided along with the applied forces. In these videos, the forces are applied in positive and negative x directions and positive and negative y directions on end only on the red block. And we can see that the error buildup is quite small for a 199 frame prediction. So uh, our method has some limitations we would, which we would address in our future work. First, we made some assumptions on the appearance of objects and the camera's intrinsics and extrinsics. We are restricted to top-down views for self-supervised learning to, due to 2D spatial transformers. And these two can be rectified by making them, like making the appearance and the camera intrinsics learnable parameters. 
uh, in this um, like in this experiments we assume non accurate mesh force measurements we did not have to investigate the effects of real world noise on our model we have evaluated our model on synthetic scenes and performance on real world scenes need to be tested so to conclude the presentation we have shown supervised and self supervised approaches to learn physical states as encodings from images and to identify and learn the physical parameters of the objects in the scene we have shown how to use the learned parameters for video prediction and evaluated our method on scenarios like pushing sliding and collisions and analyze observability of physical parameters in those scenarios and finally assess the accuracy of physical states and parameter estimation thank you for your attention yeah thank you for the interesting talk rama um i currently don't see any question on discord seems like people are still a bit sleepy in the morning um okay. i actually have a couple of questions uh, of sure. my own they might be pretty shallow because that's <clears throat> not my field of expertise but um if that's okay in the interest of time i would again move them to the discord channel uh, so that we can continue with the next talk so i would just ask you to uh check the discord channel for for questions um Okay, I mean you can ask them if we still have time. Or as I said, we are a little bit behind schedule, so um, okay, sure, yeah. Ask uh, ask you to move to Q and A to sure. Discord. Thanks um, for hosting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the talk again. Uh, it was very nice. It was very interesting. Um, our next talk will be given by Shiva Magarwal, and um, if I'm not mistaken, this will be a video presentation which will be playing now, and we'll see. Uh, about uh, Q&A afterwards. Hello. Welcome to the presentation of our work titled Visualizing Sets and Changes in Membership Using Layered Set Intersection Graphs. My name is Shivam and I will present the work on behalf of my colleagues Gleb, Michelle and Fabian. Sets are collection of elements. They are commonly used to model data in many applications. For instance, to analyze publication data, we can model research fields as sets and researchers as elements. If a researcher publishes in a research field, it becomes a member of the corresponding set. Here we show a small sample of the computer science research dataset. Venn diagrams are commonly used to visualize sets. They are intuitive and help in understanding the overlap among sets. For example, the figure represents three sets, representing three research fields, namely graphics with HCI, AI ML, and robotics. We will refer to them as base sets. Hans Peter Seidel and Hans Peter Pfister published papers only in graphics with HCI. Hence. belong to exclusively in the set similarly junzu and yoshua benjio published only in ai ml likewise gerd hasinger masayuki inaba and james m reg published only in robotics three researchers published papers in both ai ml and graphics with hci research fields hence the black dots representing them are placed in the intersecting region of the two sets Similarly, Wolfram Burgard published in robotics and AI ML. One researcher, Dinesh Manocha, published in all three fields. Hence, a black dot is placed in the center of the Venn diagram. Set visualizations like Venn diagrams face several challenges while visualizing membership of elements. The first challenge lies in analyzing details of element set membership. such as membership weight the membership weight of an element is determined by the quantitative attribute that also determines the membership of the element in our example the number of papers published by a researcher in a research field determines the membership weight the second challenge lies in analyzing temporal changes that occur due to the evolving membership of elements in sets for example analyzing the publication pattern of a researcher or the stability of contributions in research fields 
We address these challenges in our work by using layered set intersection graphs. Next, I will explain the construction of these layered set intersection graphs. First, we compute all the set intersections shown by segregating regions of the Venn diagram. Next, in layer 1, positioned at the bottom, we place all the regions containing elements that are members of the base set graphics with HCI. Similarly, we compute all the elements contained in AIML and keep them in the bottom layer. We do the same for elements belonging to robotics. Next, in layer 2, we find all pairwise combinations of base sets. We compute all intersections of two base sets along with the membership of elements in each intersection. For example, here we find all the elements belonging in both graphics with HCI and AIML. Since these elements are present in two base sets, we place them in layer 2. We repeat the process for other two set intersections and position them in the same layer. Next, we find all intersections of three sets, compute the elements contained in each and place them in the third layer and so on. For datasets with more number of base sets, we proceed in a similar way and go beyond the third layer. To identify the base sets involved in each intersection, we use color. Here, graphics with HCI is shown in green, AIML in purple and robotics in orange. Each region becomes a node in the set intersection graph. To construct edges, we use the direct subset relation between nodes. For example, since all the elements in the intersection of graphics with HCI and AIML are present in the set graphics with HCI, we draw an edge between the two nodes. Similarly, we draw edges between other nodes of the graph. The basic structure of layered set intersection graphs is ready. The structure of the graph is inspired by a concept lattice that is computed using formal concept analysis. Next, I will talk about how we use a layered set intersection graph in our visualization approach. We represent each node of the graph as a rectangle and place black filled circles to denote its constituent elements. The cardinality of a set is shown by a number at the bottom edge of the node. For instance, the figure shows that there are six elements in the set graphics with HCI. Please note that the first two circles inside the rectangle have a hat marker above them. The hat marker above a circle shows that the element has no additional memberships in other sets and hence does not appear in the layers above. Here, two circles with the hat marker show that among six researchers, there are two who published only in the field of graphics with HCI. Do you remember what their names were? They are Hans-Peter Seidel and Hans-Peter Pfister. The two horizontal bars below the rectangle encode the quantity of the two types of the elements in the set, with and without hat markers. We continue visualizing other nodes of the graphs in a similar way. Finally, we get our visualization of the layered set intersection graph. Next, we are ready to address the first challenge in set visualization, analyzing details of element set membership such as membership weight. Since in our approach, we represent each individual element in a separate region, it becomes easier to encode membership weights of each element. We encode the number of papers published by a researcher through the size of the corresponding circle. Hence, we get an updated visualization with different circle sizes. For example, here we can see that size of circles inside robotics in layer 1 varies a lot. On hovering over the circles, we get to know the name and the number of papers published by the researcher in robotics. We can also click on the circle to highlight all the occurrences of the corresponding element in the graph. For example, on clicking the circle, we see that Wolfram Burgard published in both AIML and robotics. However, the circle size indicate 
that he published most of the papers in robotics. To address the second challenge of analyzing temporal changes due to evolving element set memberships, we construct layered set intersection graphs for each time step. We need an approach where users can navigate between time steps, see the temporal changes from different perspectives, and are able to do in-depth exploration of dynamic set data. We propose an approach with linked views. The figure shows the full interface of the implemented approach. The interface is mainly divided into four areas. The set intersection view in the middle visualizes the layered set intersection graphs. The timeline component is positioned at the bottom. The element list and the degree distribution components are in the right. The degree distribution component shows the distribution of elements based on the element's maximum number of memberships in different sets. Zooming in on the element list, for each element, the list shows the name, sum of membership weight in selected time step, and spark line showing the evolution of element's membership weight. A vertical dotted line in the spark line marks the first appearance of the element in the dataset. Colored bars below the name highlight memberships of an element in the selected time step. For instance, Masayuki Inaba published 15 papers in robotics and made contributions from the first time step. On the other hand, Sergey Levine published in the other two fields appeared in 2008-2010 time step and has an increasing trend of publishing papers. Also, hovering over a row in the list highlights the corresponding element in the main view. Next, I will present further details of our approach through the tool demo. We propose three views to provide different perspectives on temporal changes in dynamic set data. They are static, diff and aggregated views. The static view shows the data for one selected time step, diff view for two selected time steps, and aggregated view for all the time steps. The timeline contains time step labels in left to right chronological order. To explore the set intersection graph of a particular time step, we can click on the corresponding label. We have already discussed the encodings used in the set intersection graph in the static view for one time step. To explore the exact changes in memberships between any two time steps, we use the diff view. To enable the diff view, just select any two time step labels while holding down the control key. Changes between two successive time steps can be quickly explored by clicking the rectangular box between two time steps. Here we select the diff view between 2008-2010 and 2011-2013. Let's refer to the two time steps as T1 and T2, where T1 occurs before T2. Hence, in the timeline, the time step level of T1 is located at the left with respect to that of T2. To represent the data from two selected time steps, we vertically divide the encodings into two halves, left and right. For example, the left semicircle shows the membership of an element in T1 while the right semicircle shows the membership of an element in T2. The difference in the size of semicircles shows the changes in the membership of the element. For instance, Hans-Peter Seidel published 23 papers in graphics with HCI venues during 2008-2010, while 13 articles in the next three years. Similarly, the cardinality of a set in two time steps is shown by the numbers positioned at the bottom edge of the rectangular node. Below the node, horizontal bars show the number of elements belonging to the set, present only in T1 time step, only in T2, and in both selected time steps. To summarize changes about gained or lost memberships among sets, we draw interlayer summary edges at the right side of the graph. Here we see there was one element which went from layer 1 to layer 2, denoting that earlier it was present in only one set, but later gained membership in an additional set. On hovering, we see the tapered edge and infer that the element went from publishing only in robotics 
to both robotics and graphics with HCI. Clicking the edge selects the transitioning elements. The name of researcher is James M. Reg. To show the evolution of memberships between first and last time steps, we select them for the diff view. We see that two researchers went from publishing in robotics to all the three research fields. Their names are Dinesh Manocha and James M. Reg. Also, we see two instances where both halves of the circle are present, denoting two other researchers published in both time steps. They are Masayuki Inaba and Joshua Bengio. But in both time steps, they published papers only in one field, Masayuki in robotics while Joshua in AIML. In both cases, the bigger size of the right semicircle shows that they publish more articles in the later time step. To see an overview of temporal changes, we provide an aggregated representation for all time steps, which can be selected by clicking the Aggregate All button. Please note that an element is not necessarily present in all time steps. It is possible that in a time step, an element is present in none of the sets available in the dataset. As a result, a specific intersection may also have no members in some time steps. On an overview level, we need to show whether an element was absent in some time steps. Similarly, we need to show whether a set or an intersection was empty in some time steps. We encode this information consistently for elements, sets and intersections via opacity. If some circles are darker, the corresponding elements are present in more time steps than other elements. Similarly, if the left edge of a rectangular box is more black, the corresponding set or intersection is non-empty in more number of time steps. The size of a circle represents the average weight of membership across all time steps in the corresponding set. These details for an element are available on demand on hovering over the circle. Selecting an element highlights it in the graph and draws an evolution chart of the element's membership. The chart is drawn on demand and appended in the timeline. There are several filters that can be used together to enable in-depth analysis of the data. A user can simultaneously select any time step, any set or an intersection, a summary edge and a degree of element. For instance, to find researchers who limited their focus to contributing only in robotics in 2017-2019 from 2014-2016, we select the diff view and apply two filters. We see one such researcher, Wolfram Burgard. Now let's switch to another application example and discuss the evolution of developer activities in software projects. For this example, we include the dataset of developer activities in the Linux GitHub repository from 2008 until 2017. The five modules of the repository, namely file systems, drivers, arc, net, and kernel, are modeled as sets, whereas developers contributing to the repository as elements. Number of commits by a developer quantify the membership weight of elements in sets. We filter those developers who made at least 100 commits and get 111 such committers. The first insight we gain is about the details of element membership in individual set intersections. The figure shows the intersection of all five modules aggregated across all time steps. We can see that there were 23 developers who contributed in all the modules in at least one time step. Black circles represent developers who consistently contributed to all the modules in each time step. The circle size reveals difference in their average number of commits, which was highest for Greg Croa Hartman. The second insight we get is about comparing the stability of contributions in two modules across two time steps. We select the diff view between 2016 and 2017 time steps and focus on the ARC module, which had the least change in terms of cardinality. However, 
Change in cardinality alone is not a good indicator of stability. On a closer look, we see that the arc module has many semicircles. The horizontal bars beneath the rectangle show that 11 previous committers dropped out. The cardinality remained stable because 12 new developers came in and contributed to the module. In contrast, the driver's module has the most significant number of developers who contributed in both time steps. Hence, across the two time steps, the driver's module was more stable in terms of developer contributions. Remaining on the diff view, we see many edges going up and down, indicating the shifting focus of developers. Upward edges indicate that developers contributed to more modules than before and vice versa for downward edges. The edge from layer 2 to the first layer indicates that 5 developers narrowed their focus to only one module. Next, let's see the differences in patterns of contribution activity in some of the developers. Through evolution charts, we observe stable and consistent contribution patterns to two modules by Philippe and to all five modules by Greg. We also see an inconsistent contribution across time steps by Paul. Additionally, we observe that a developer, Bartlomage, contributed in the first and last two time steps with a gap of six years in the middle. There are several other insights that can be found through our proposed approach. Our approach generalizes well to the dynamic set data from various domains. Check out the implementation to explore several other datasets. To conclude, we present an approach that helps in visualizing weighted and dynamic element set memberships. We believe visualizing the details of element memberships in dynamic sets is important and provides rich insights. Thank you for listening to this talk. Transition. Okay, thank you uh, for this interesting talk, Shivam. Um, I see that there's a question uh, on Discord. Uh, Ido Freeman asks, uh, the visualization uh, surely is rather fancy. Um, so what is your target use case uh, for this method? Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Ido, for the question. I'm happy to be here. Uh, the target use case, yes. So we have discussed in the paper two application examples. So I've discussed uh, in the video an application example where you can study uh, the movement or the shifting of focus of developers in um, a software repository. So we don't focus on any one application example. Rather, we provide a general uh, visualization where you can study or analyze these dynamic sets. So yeah, the short answer would be um, it is very generic and it can be used in any data sets. Okay. So my own question, while we are still waiting for more uh, questions on Discord, is um, going in the same direction a bit. Um, so it's on the one hand quite quite clear, but also um, quite complicated. So uh, or a bit complex. Uh, so um, did you already evaluate this a little bit with users? So who would your target users be? It's more like visualization experts uh, who are used to complex visualizations or also novices? Do you have any feedback on that already? Perfect. That's a good question, Michelle. Thanks for that question. Uh, yes, so regarding uh, the complexity first, yes, uh, it's uh, it has many encodings that makes it a bit difficult to understand. And that's why it can't be uh, used by novice users. It has to be used by uh, people who have background in visualization. That's for sure. But that being said, um, the visualizations which uh, show this weighted and dynamic set memberships, it's very new. So we don't know enough about, first of all, what kind of analysis tasks users need to perform. So yes, I think the simplification of the visualizations will come next as soon as we learn more about what kind of tasks and, uh, uh, and use cases there are, for sure. So yes, uh, currently it's not targeted for novice users to answer your question. Um, I forgot the second part, sorry. Oh, that, that pretty much answers it. <laughs> um, so we have time for one more question uh, from Helwig Hauser. Uh, he would be interested in the scalability of the approach. So up to how many sets and how many elements did you successfully uh, employ in this approach or um, 
yeah, can you can you just comment on the scalability? I'm very happy for this question again. So in when we discuss scalability, we always talk about number of sets and elements. But what we learned is we should also talk about the number of intersections and the level of details and the number of time steps we show. So to answer the question, number of sets, we uh, experimented with six or seven sets. That's also one of the limitations. We cannot go beyond uh, this number currently. Uh, regarding number of elements, we showed up to 500 elements. That's uh, somewhat decent. Um, then number of time steps, we showed 10. And we again show individual details uh, of the member uh, of elements in terms of its membership weight. That is something which uh, we really advocate to move forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there are more questions uh, just coming up uh, in Discord, so I would ask you uh, to uh, also check the, our Discord channel. Um, but in the interest of time, again, uh, we should now move on to uh, the next speaker. So thank you again, uh, Shiva. And uh, our next speaker will be uh, Marco Agus. And he will uh, talk about in -shape, invariant shape descriptors for visual analysis of histology, cellular, and nuclear shapes. Uh, Marco, stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm Marco Agos, uh, and I come from uh, Ahmad bin Khalifa University in Qatar. And uh, this work is a collaboration uh, between uh, our uh, college and uh, the University of Turin and Sirius 4 in Italy. And uh, today I will talk uh, about digital histology and uh, geometry processing. So as a first uh, few words uh, of introduction about the application domain, uh, since uh, this is a, uh, a session uh, mixed uh, with uh, different uh, people from different domains, uh, I will uh, say a few words about the digital histology. And uh, it's like uh, the, the field is uh, emerged uh, like four decades ago. And uh, since uh, the introduction of uh, high resolution scanners that were able uh, to automatically produce very high resolution image that can replicate uh, glass slides. I mean, it's like this a concept uh, of visual microscopy. And since the introduction of uh, these machines, uh, they are used for having and for getting uh, high resolution images that can be used for uh, diagnosis. Uh, on daily basis and uh, also for doing scientific investigations, either in the medical field and in biology field. And uh, as you can imagine, the advent of uh, this kind of uh, technology is leading uh, to the development uh, and uh, to the connection uh, with uh, the emerging field of artificial intelligence for trying to find solutions for uh, high impact uh, problems that can affect the life of uh, the old people. And, uh, the technical way on how to get uh, high resolution images uh, is based on the usage of staining uh, that are chemical substances that are used for providing contrast and the color to the section that are extracted uh, from tissues. And uh, they are able to reveal uh, information about the structures, uh, cellular structures that are in uh, the extracted uh, portion of, uh, of tissue. And uh, it's like there are uh, many, many public resources that you can find online. So tons of data. So for uh, even for the people in our community is a field that uh, we should address and they should consider very carefully because there are, uh, there are many resources uh, available publicly where you can find the interesting data to work on. Uh, for uh, technically point of view, it's like histology images are, uh, uh, contain uh, uh, tissues at very high resolution. And uh, according to the stain you use, uh, you can have uh, um, a clear uh, representation of uh, cellular structures, uh, and uh, you can have resolution that it's uh, uh, four, that where you can have four samples until four samples uh, uh, per micron. So in this, and you can have a, a very clear identification of uh, uh, the structures that you are interested to study. Uh, if, for uh, what uh, it's related to challenges, uh, um, it's like the main problem, it's like uh, also, you know, the main goal of people working in this field is to try to find uh, 
uh, automatic methods uh, for uh, distinguish uh, healthy uh, tissues from uh, uh, not not healthy tissues. It's like a or a having uh, inflammatory problems or even uh, cancer uh, problems. And uh, this is, a, you know, for a, as an ultimate goal for uh, working on this kind of uh, image data. But uh, also it's like there are many technical challenges that are related uh, on how to manage these images because they can uh, easily reach the, uh, the size of uh, order of gigapixels. In many cases, you can have uh, uh, sequence of pictures representing the same tissues uh, that they can be stuck together and they needed to manage them. But also it's uh, really important. And it's like, this is like some uh, um, requirements from uh, the medical uh, people working in the field is uh, to find ways on how to perform visual annotations uh, to keep the visual annotation to store them and uh, how to integrate uh, all data in a uh, visual analytics frameworks. Uh, connected to the first main goal of having automatic classification in order to recognize what uh, tissues are healthy and no, it's like there is the problem of uh, automatic segmentation and uh, to auto -autom automatically recognize structures in a way to perform uh, uh, automatic statistical analysis. And this is leading to, to a new emerging field in the medical uh, community that's called computational pathology but also connected to a, even a new field that is related to the family of omics fields that is called the tissue omics. So let's uh, get uh, in touch with uh, the main focus of our talk. It's like the, the first thing is like the motivation. I mean, uh, why uh, did we decide to study and to use shape analysis for this kind of data? And uh, the reasons are more or less three and this one uh, is because uh, we had the previous experience uh, in uh, neuroscience for the analysis of nuclear envelopes extracted from 3D image stacks uh, acquired with the serial section electron microscopy. And uh, it's like an, uh, this was collaboration with the neuro neuroscience. Uh, And uh, there was an indication, uh, and uh, we had we had we had the in indication. Uh, oh, Marco, but I think you you had a short connection problem, and your screen sharing stopped. Okay, sorry. Not yet. No, we can see your video, but. Now I can, oh, sorry guys. No worries. It seems that my Zoom is blocked. I don't know where's my Zoom. Hmm. Wait, wait. Okay, share screen again. Okay, I found it. Yeah. It's okay now? Okay. okay. Well, restart in your full screen mode and we will go back to um, to, to, to being live. So start your, uh, your presentation. So I start, the presentation is started, okay. In full Wait. screen, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait. Okay, it's fine. So we are back. So, sorry. Okay. Sorry for uh, the interruption. Uh, it's like uh, I was talking about the motivation uh, of uh, our work, and it's like uh, I was saying that uh, we uh, about our previous experience in uh, 3D analysis of uh, nuclear envelopes. And uh, it's like, uh, and we had a contact and we had the first contacts with digital pathologists that, that were interested in uh, the pipeline. And they were saying uh, that it's like uh, that the uh, contour shapes are in interest for them in a way to find features that they can provide us indication on how to perform diagnosis and how to perform investigations. 
And uh, in general, what we thought is like, okay, I mean, uh, the problem is interesting, but uh, extracting contours, uh, even now for uh, the, the pathologist is a really tedious and manual process. But nowadays, it's like the good news are that uh, deep learning methods are starting to provide segmentation, automatic segmentation uh, with increasing accuracy. And uh, we started using uh, the, the, some uh, methods uh, derived from uh, the popular UNET uh, architecture. And uh, we are starting uh, to get uh, quite uh, tons of uh, uh, extracted uh, nuclear shapes uh, that can be used for uh, performing uh, uh, automatic uh, com computations and the geometry processing. That's, uh, so that was the motivation for our work. Also, we consider that the 2D shape processing is less complicated than 3D shape processing, since the curve parameterization is much simpler than surface parameterization. It's like it's very easy to convert original shape, 2D shape, in a, in a mapping to a circle. And finally, it's like a good news is that annotated data sets are becoming available. So it's like here we mostly focused on a pan nuke. Uh, data set that contains a labeled uh, nuclei that are, can use the, for performing a classification in a neoplastic tissues or inflammatory tissues and so on. And also nowadays there is a proliferation of medical contests for performing automatic segmentation and automatic classification. And uh, we are starting profiting of uh, this kind of available data. Uh, so the main uh, proposed uh, uh, method for uh, this uh, paper is a geometry processing pipeline that uh, is a robust translation of 3D surface processing and is based on uh, the development on invariant shape descriptor that can be used for closed contours and is based on differential geometry and Fourier analysis. So at the end of the pipeline, uh, we get a compact descriptor that can be used either for classification even together with other descriptors, but also can be used for visual analysis together with the dimension reduction schemes and also other clustering schemes and so on. So for the related work, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the problem of shape retrieval is uh, quite old. I mean, it's part of the prehistory of computer science, and, uh, but still is a hot topic uh, in image processing. In, in general, we can distinguish between uh, two different techniques. Uh, one uh, is a region-based and it based on uh, different kinds uh, of polynomial moments. The most popular one are the Zernik and the Chebyshev. Uh, but also we can have boundary-based techniques that are based mostly on Fourier descriptors, but also on curvature descriptions and wavelets and so on. In our case, uh, we decided to uh, modif modify and uh, to deal on a hybrid method based on, on uh, curvatures and the Fourier descriptors. But the main difference is that we profited from uh, the recent outcomes in a discrete differential geometry that uh, I will show you in a few minutes. So uh, I start now uh, talking about uh, the pipeline and uh, it's like a, a brief overview of the pipeline. As first, you know, it's like uh, we can have something uh, or, you know, or manual annotation or uh, uh, UNET or GUNET or some other deep learning technology that uh, is that extracts contour from us from uh, a digital image and uh, from uh, uh, the extracted contours uh, as first uh, we perform a, a chordal parameterization a very simple parameterization that uh, maps the uh, accumulated length on the shape to a circular to a circle and uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's quite simple but it provides us the basis for the following steps of the pipeline so the pipeline is composed by a few steps. The first one is uh, the smoothing step that is uh, based on uh, the chordal length parameterization. It is an iterative process uh, that we derived from paper, uh, cigarette paper, whole cigarette paper, present the gauge code about collision detection with the uh, bounding boxes. And uh, this method, it's like an iterative method that moves iteratively vertices in the original shape according to the uh, average of the length of the adjacent uh, wedge edges and uh, 
with this, uh, with this uh, scheme, uh, we are able in a limited number of iterations of removing from the original shapes, uh, spikes and noise. Then after, after the smoothing, uh, we perform a resampling uh, that is uh, uh, based on a geodesic parameterization. And for doing that, we uh, use a method of shifted linear interpolation that was presented uh, quite ago by, by Blue et al. It's, it's an interesting method that uh, shows that uh, for doing a linear interpolation, you can uh, use an optimal shift that is around 0.21 in order to get better uh, interpolation about uh, a discrete representation. In this way, we have a, a geodesically uniform resampling of the original shape. After uh, these uh, preliminary steps, uh, we can uh, perform uh, the computation of uh, discrete uh, curvatures. And uh, to this end, uh, we decide uh, to use uh, the formulation uh, proposed by Bobenko uh, uh, et al. That is, uh, you know, the founder of uh, the discrete differential uh, geometry field. And uh, the main thing and the nice thing of this kind of schemes uh, is like the discrete differential geometry is trying to find geometry constructions for representing uh, formulas, calculus formulas that are good either in the discrete domain, but they tend to the real solution when the, uh, the discretization tends to go to the continuous uh, field. So in this case, uh, the natural uh, way to find discrete uh, uh, curvatures in uh, 2D shapes uh, is by using uh, the concept of obsculating circles that uh, in which uh, as, uh, as probably some of you know, it's like the uh, curvature in a, in a line is the inverse of the radius of the osculating circle. So for doing that, we start, we can, we can uh, do that either on a vertex basis. So, you know, it's like from the vertex, uh, we just consider the two closest vertex and we compute the osculating uh, circle in a, uh, passing from the three points and the inverse of the radius of the circle would be the vertex curvature. But also we can extend these schemes for computing a sort of hedge curvature by considering the B sector, the middle point of the of, of edges contain uh, of edges representing the shape and applying the same scheme for finding a osculating circle that would represent the, uh, the discrete curvature placed in the edge or, or, or better in the middle point of uh, uh, an edge connecting the two vertices. So in this way, we have a continuous signal, more or less continuous signal, or a discrete signal representing the curvature of a given shape. And this is uh, already a feature representation that can be used for uh, um, for many applications. And uh, it's found that it's like, uh, since it's uh, the local definition of curvatures, it's uh, invariant with respect to rotation of the original shapes. But for uh, getting uh, an invariance also with respect to the shifting, so to the starting point from which uh, we start the computation, uh, we employed uh, a decomposition based on elliptic Fourier analysis. So the curvature function is represented as a linear combination of elliptic uh, trigonometric function. So linear combination of uh, weight the cosine and sin with the same frequency. And uh, once we get this composition for getting the uh, invariance with respect to shift, consider the harmonic energies according to what proposed by Kazdan et al. In these ways, we have a compact and complete contour descriptor. Uh, since we used the uh, uniform, uniform uh, resampling and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we are under the umbrella of the Nyquist, Nyquist theory and uh, given the original curvature signal, we have uh, invariance with respect to rotation, but uh, after the Fourier analysis, we get invariance to uh, shifting. So in these ways, we have uh, a compact descriptor. So according to the sampling that we use for representing the shapes, we can have uh, we, we can have a discrete and complete uh, uh, descriptor. 
uh, what we did uh, as first uh, is uh, to try consistency test. So we considered uh, a very popular and uh, very used uh, data set. It's called MPEG-7. It's composed by 70 classes representing different objects. And for each class, there is 20 binary images. And uh, this is uh, still used for testing shape retrieval uh, methods. In our case, uh, with a simple super vector machine applied to our descriptor, we got an accuracy that is comparable to even more complicated methods, still under the currently used deep learning or based methods. But with respect to the model, originally model based methods, is still competitive. So, and also we need to consider that some classes features are in the inner part, so they cannot be recovered by our method that is only considering uh, the shape contours. And it's like, so you can see in a confusion matrix that there are some issues for some classes. Anyway, it's like we, uh, we had uh, promising, uh, we had a confirmation that, uh, you know, the, at least uh, the formulation is correct, so we can use it for different uh, uh, applications. And, uh, we started uh, trying and we had uh, some preliminary outcomes uh, with uh, our collaborators uh, for using uh, the, disc the, the our uh, compact descriptor. And uh, for doing that, uh, we coupled uh, with uh, dimension reduction schemes in order to have a 2D projection of uh, the shape features. And also we tried some automatic clustering. Uh, it's like in this case, uh, we are showing a, a UMAP uh, together with K-means. Uh, and uh, our neuroscience collaborators, they are starting to use it for check for correct staining and for finding some problems in, in the shape recognition, but also they are using it for discriminate clear nuclei from vessels and blood soma. They are starting to, to use it for every computational uh, applications on their neuroscience data. On the same way, uh, similarly, it can be used for uh, digital pathology and uh, applications. In that case, uh, you can use it for uh, finding uh, uh, portions of the parametric space that are associated uh, to the incorrect segmentation, so for correcting uh, the labeling, but also you can try cluster the cells, especially the cluster, uh, the cells inside the digital image according to the shape features that you can recover in a parameter space after uh, the dimension reduction and projection. Uh, of course, it's like, uh, this is uh, the starting point of uh, our research and it's like, uh, we have uh, many limitations still. Uh, one of them is that uh, it's like, we are still in search of uh, correct taxonomies that can be mapped to the shape features. And also, since our ultimate goal is uh, to try to, to put ourselves in the game of automatic classification, and uh, it's like our target is the Panuk data set. Uh, you can see here that's like our shape descriptor, even if it's able to provide some indication of some areas where most likely some classes can have a quite ch good chance to be classified still uh, we have some uh, very noisy dimension reduction to this end uh, it's like we had uh, if we had uh, some hint from digital pathologists that, that it's like not only the shape contour is important for uh, understanding and uh, try to classify and individuate discriminate various cells but it's also important uh, to focus on the inner appearance of the cells and to this end, we realized that in most cases, the cells exhibit recurrent texture patterns. So we plan to employ sparse coding schemes in order to find the other descriptors that are mostly based on the inner appearance of cells. So okay, we are started using case pairs out of coders for doing that. And uh, as future work, I mean, it's like also we realized that we are still uh, working on model-based methods, but uh, we realized that we are eating the wall with uh, this kind of methods. So we are also moving and uh, working on machine learning methods. And to this end, uh, we started applying a fast AI, fast AI together with the noisy student method that was recently presented at CVPR. And uh, in this case, uh, we extract uh, singular uh, cells and singular nuclei using a black background, uh, and uh, we are starting to get the promising results with the Panuk datasets. 
Uh, in parallel, we are also working uh, on a system level and uh, try to integrate the values to discrete also on uh, uh, various visual analysis pipelines. We are focusing on QPath and OpenSlide. And uh, finally, it's like the, we are, st we are uh, starting uh, to have applications uh, with uh, collaborations uh, with uh, pediatric histopathology that, of course, uh, they are interested in this kind of uh, technologies. So as a conclusion, I mean, this is more or less the end of this talk. It's like I presented a, a shape descriptor, 2D shape descriptor that can be used for analysis of cells and nuclei extracted from histology image. It is invariant to rotations and shift, and it can be coupled with the automatic segmentation frameworks and digital pathology pipelines. Of course, this is a general method that can be used also for other applications. Uh, as I saw, as, as I showed, uh, there are still many challenges to solve. If you are interested, uh, we uh, released uh, a code, uh, an implementation, a Python implementation, simple Python implementation of the pipeline in, in a GitHub repository. You can uh, contact uh, me or uh, the senior author of the paper, uh, Dr. Jens Snyder, and uh, it's like I'm uh, ready to answer uh, to your questions. Thank you very much for the attention. and. Uh, have a nice uh, conference. Yeah, thank you, Marco, for a interesting talk. Um, while we are still waiting for, for questions uh, from Discord, I will start with a, of course, very simple one. Um, you mentioned um, clustering via, um, for example, uh, dbscan or k-means. Uh, respect to k-means, um, well, is there any guidance how to pick the k, uh, a suitable k? I mean, it's like we are letting uh, the, our uh, scientists, domain scientists, to choose the number. I mean, it's like uh, as first um, evaluations, I mean, uh, we sent them the code. It's like they were play, they could play around, also changing the parameters. It's like, okay. And once they found something interesting, you know, it's like they, 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 they told us, okay, it's like this is, in this case, we are, were able to find this kind of problem in the data and so on. Consider that is still really preliminary. Uh, results. So, you know, it's like the potential of this uh, method are not explored at all for the moment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have another question by Daniel Baum uh, in this court. Um, he, he thanks you also for the interesting talk and uh, says, it seems to me that differential signatures could also be used as invariant shape descriptors. Have you looked into this? No. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, we were, uh, you know, it's like uh, we got uh, really much uh, attracted uh, from uh, the formulation uh, from uh, Bobeco. So at the beginning, so we started, you know, we, we didn't uh, explore that much, uh, the, you know, that's like uh, other, other kind of uh, geometric features uh, because uh, after we decided to move uh, to the more, you know, it's like more attractive uh, image features. Also, if I can, uh, you probably show again uh, this uh, slide. Since we decided to put on a back background uh, the content uh, of uh, each extracted nucleo, it's like we think that uh, using a sort of you know sparse coding uh, could be able also to extract information of the contour. Yeah, and it's like we are pretty confident. That it's like okay, like once we will uh, change uh, completely the descriptor, also considering the inner part, we will uh, uh, get something that will uh, also uh, include. Uh, what we were doing until now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Thomas Schulz asks, uh, you propose a two-step approach that segments first and classifies the cells in a second step. Yeah. Did you consider a multi-class uh, semantic segmentation that might solve your problem in a single step? We consider it and uh, we will uh, definitely explore this avenue. Yes, thank you for the, if you, if you do the comment. Yes, well, we already thought about that. And also consider that this an avenue that is practiced also by other people. So, you know, I mean, it's like we have different avenues to explore. Consider that it's like that um, there is uh, many, many groups are working on that. Uh, it's like you can imagine how impactful is this kind of topic. Uh, so, you know, also, I mean, I want to profit also for our community. Probably it would be very, very nice uh, if we start uh, to put uh, more resources in, in this topic, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I still see people typing, so maybe I um, ask a question of my own in between. Um, also probably a very 
not very suitable question, but still, I mean, you, answer, you, you mentioned in the beginning uh, that you uh, resort to the 2D uh, rather than 3D because it's less complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my question is, yeah. okay. would you see any benefits of using a full 3D? So was it just a practical choice? Or uh, would the 3D shape actually not give? Oh, wow! Well, I mean, it's like in the in a, in the concept in a, I mean, probably it's like there was a little bit of confusion when I made the talk. It's like we started from neuroscience data that's like and and they acquire 3D stacks, so they are really interested in 3D reconstruction. But this is really another important problem for them. Or how? to segment and reconstruct 3D structures. In digital pathology, they just splat everything on the glass. So they can have different slices of the same tissue and they also need to register them, but they, we cannot consider it as a real 3D problem. So they are still, luckily for us, they are still in the 2D domain. I see, I see, okay, thank you. Um... So uh, I currently only see your co-author against Schneider typing in Discord, and I guess he will just have a comment, not a question. <laughs> no, I expect so. Uh, probably he's uh, chatting. Uh, it's like he's replying also to all the other questions. Yeah. So uh, at this point, uh, thanks I, to Jens, of course. <laughs> I, would, I would thank you again for for the, the nice uh, for a nice talk, for a nice presentation. And um, of yes. course, uh, also please uh, have an have an eye on the Discord uh, joint talk too. Of course, yeah. Uh, in case thank questions. Thank you, up. thank you for organizing the conference, and uh, thanks uh, for all attending the talk. Thank you very much again. Yeah. Yeah. The good, uh, good conference to all of us. <laughs> uh, we will now have uh, two or three minutes now, probably uh, four or five minutes break before the industry talk starts. Uh, so you can get yourself another coffee and uh, stay tuned for uh, for the next talk. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to the session. <laughs>